Hello and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And uh, myself, Stephen George. Good evening. Good evening. It's Sunday the 13th of January 2019, our second show in 2019. And my God, there's so much going on out there at the moment. We could actually fill a show with just myself and Steve talking about the things that are going on. And if this is the start of the year and all, this, all these things are going on, my God, what is, what is, is it going to be like in six months' time? So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Mind you, I mean, we're halfway through January already, near enough. You know, so, you know, it's just flying by. Right, before we get into things, uh, we had the United We Start roundtable yesterday. It was the first one of the new year. Um, if you want to check that out, go over to unitedwestart.org and the podcast is there for 2019. Have a listen to myself, Detlev, Michael and uh, Matt Navarro um, talking about all the things that are going on, um, America, Yellow Vest Movement, everything there, um, and what's happening. Check that out there. A guest on the show tonight is uh, a chap called Tom Ryan. We've had Tom on the show before. He talked about his, uh, his day-to-day work, his uh, practice as a hypnotherapist. And uh, we're going to be talking about, because we have the uh, Independence Day coming up on the 21st of January, and uh, Tom is uh, involved with the IRB, he's a member of the IRB, uh, so we're going to be talking to Tom all about the history, uh, who the IRB are, and the history of the IRB, and Irish history, and um, what we're told and what the real truth is, that's the plan of attack anyway, that's what we want to do, so... We'll be bringing Tom in in a few minutes' uh, time, but before we uh, crack on, let's find out what the communication channels are. Okay, folks, communication channels. The communication channels are email, info at oymireland.com, by phone, 046 1212 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Thanks very much, Mary. Yes, the OAM chat room can be found on the website. The website address is www.oymradio.com. You will see all the lovely links on the left-hand side there. Uh, You'll see the link to the YouTube channel, uh, also to the email, which is info at oymradio.com. And as we say every week, if you haven't dropped us a line and you'd like to, that is the email address. Uh, if you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener and you haven't contacted the show and maybe a subject you'd like us to cover or a guest you'd like us to uh, possibly have on a future show, just drop us a, an email. You will also see the links there for Skype, uh, also anti-social media, Facebook, Twitter, and the the new kid in the block, MeWe. Uh, and a lot of people have actually joined us on MeWe, so uh, kudos to all of you who have made the change and broken away from Facebook. We also have on the website there, you will see the link for Patreon, uh, if you would like to hit us up on that link there and just check out the Patreon page. If you're interested in joining up, please do so. For the price of a cup of coffee, uh, you can uh, make a big difference here at OYM Radio. Uh, The chat room is also there as well. Uh, And if you have registered, you can log in, as many people already have. And a big hi and welcome to all of you. Uh, We're also streaming on People's Internet Radio as well. And the chat room over there on PIR uh, is full of uh, equally friendly people. Great bunch. uh, And they live over there every Sunday. And so you uh, you can check that out as well. Uh, also, there's uh, links on the website there to uh, our previous podcasts and loads of great information as well. Brilliant stuff. Um, we'd just like to say a big thank you to the people who are donating and the Patreon uh, listeners. Um, fantastic. Thank you for doing that. It's much appreciated. We're humbled by it. And um, thanks a lot for your support. It really does mean a lot. Now, the next story that uh, we're going to read out is a story that was sent over to us by JJ, uh, one of our listeners. And Steve's going to... Tell us all about that. Okay. Uh, this is uh, a, web links, a link from a website there, discerningthemystery.com. And it says, we've been waiting for them. Now it appears they have arrived. The first of what will likely be, uh, likely be many, possibly hundreds, of military tribunals has begun. The tribunals commence on January the 2nd, according to the Department of Defence. And these proceedings began with a case that could very easily unravel the the probably 
false mainstream narrative of the September 11th attacks. It seems that all of the reports about the preparations and massive construction operations at Guantanamo Bay were just as substantial as anticipated. However, it is still important that we remain attentive and avoid getting ahead of ourselves with regard to oncoming disclosures. It's been predicted that many of those who have chosen to blindly default uh, to mainstream propaganda may panic upon hearing the truths which come forward during these tribunals. These mainstream fanatics might believe that the world is ending when they see the opposite of many of the mainstream media narratives proving to be true. This may require each of those who have done their research and are able to articulate their knowledge of these events to be available to explain these details to their friends, family, neighbours, etc. as the events progress. This means that many of us need to come out of the conspiratorial closet in making this information public with those who may not be aware of it. By doing this, we can help to ease the shock which the public will likely experience if and when uh, they see their once admired public figures facing a military tribunal. It is recommended that we only present information that can be officially substantiated, at least initially. Uh, it may also be a wise course of action to gain the working understanding of these matters so that if we are questioned on any issues, we can easily give a helpful answer or at least point people in the direction they are seeking, or point in the direction for the information they are seeking. Exactly. You know, there is that kind of comment that when all hell is breaking loose, please make your way to the local conspiracy theorist. And it does, it does a bit of logic in that because as if these tribunals happen and uh, as they seem to be going on, things seem to be really hotting up over there in the States, um, and people who are just in the matrix, I mean, will just be shocked. They'll go, what the hell is going on? What's this all about? They're the people that need to be educated and sat down and had a chat with. So just be aware that that might be happening. Um, the other thing on the list is, uh, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Vince from Oregon, UK, who gifted us uh, a, a, a huge Oregon pyramid for the OAM studio, which sits proudly between myself and Steve. Uh, thank you, Vince. It looks great. It's a massive pyramid, and it's obviously going to radiate positive energy and everything else. Um, and it was, we were surprised because we didn't know it was coming in the post. So it was a pleasant surprise there. Um, a big thank you to Vince. Um, if we had Vince on the show, and he makes these, and they're fantastic-looking uh, pyramids, uh, and the stuff that he does is really nice. Um, so uh, if you want to check out uh, Vince on Facebook, go to, uh, just type in Oregon UK and check him out there. But uh, a big thank you to Vince for sending that over. We'll ho hopefully benefit from it over the next few weeks. I tell you, I wouldn't fancy having to use it as an enema. It's oh, huge. <laughs> definitely not. It's definitely not. absolutely huge and fair play. Uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It really is beautiful. If you want to see a picture of it, you can go over to Facebook or MeWe and it's, uh, it's on there. Um, right, how's your week? Yeah, my week's fine. Uh, not too much to report, as I always say. Uh, Joan had something up there in the chat room about uh, deep space radio bursts that have been picked up in, I think it was picked up in the UK. I think it was the UK, I, I, I could be mistaken. But that happened during the week and Sammy is coming from quite a ways away. Uh, so scientists are busy uh, trying to figure out exactly what it is and where is it coming from. So, uh, you know, is it, is it the aliens or is it something else? Could be but, just um, something else. Well, well, you never know. It could be anything. Let's, let, let's you know, let's let's just kind of leave it there and put, you know, put a pin in it, as the Americans say. Mm. Uh, but that's it. It'll be interesting to see what it is. Um, I did put two links on the top of the chat room there and obviously the top of the chat room has gone away from me now uh, so I can't reach those links so if anyone in the chat room if you have seen the links already uh, one is to uh, there was a video posted up on uh, Facebook earlier on in relation to EBC 46 uh, did, you, did you see it? no no well basically what EBC 46 was it was uh, a, a a, pla a, a tree, I think, it was, or a blushwood tree, I think, or blushwood something, uh, is found in Queensland in Australia. And uh, the report actually said that one of the, the, the seeds from this tree, they actually showed you the seed, they cracked it open, and there was this, like, it looked like a pus inside it, for, for want of a better word. And um, they, were, they actually said that it had cancer-healing properties. 
So what they did, they got a mouse with a tumour, they injected this uh, stuff, this EB4, EBC46, directly into the tumour, and within 48 hours the tumour had started to, well, it had pre- it killed it basically. It promoted the, the, the white blood cells to kill it, and the, the body went into spontaneous remission. Uh, so that was fine. So then they tried to do a uh, trials on humans, and one of the one of the ladies that was interviewed, she actually had, uh, I think, it was under her arm, and she had uh, an injection directly into it. And within a, within forty eight hours, within minutes, she said she noticed a difference. And within 48 hours, she noticed a massive difference. And within, I think, a space of seven days, the tumour had gone. Wow. Gone. Completely disappeared. Not to be seen. Uh, So this uh, report on Facebook was basically saying that this was kind of the way forward. And they were going to start doing trials more. More big trials. And it was looking really promising. And the I think the date on this article it was either 2014 or 2016. But I think I think it was 2014. And it never went any further. Why? Mm. Because Big Pharma shut it down. Hey, now, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I don't believe everything I read on the internet, but uh, there was a report saying that the forest where this particular uh, blushwood is found, that it's supposed to be heavily guarded now. Big Pharma took it over, allegedly, and it's supposed to be guarded 24-7 by armed guards, and no one gets in or out. Well, it's just funny, you know, I do do agree, you have to kind of read everything and be sceptical on the internet, but, you know, I think we believe the fact that if somebody does find an alternative cure or something similar for cancer, that the big pharma will get involved and do something about it. So I think we can accept that as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, And there was a report, there was a link actually then on the internet to say, you know, is this story true or false? And when you click on it, uh, there was, uh, the report said that basically if this alleged cure contained uh, amygdalin. Uh, I'm not, I know I'm not, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but Laetrile or you know, uh, B17, as it's also known, uh, they were saying that, yes, there could be some credence to the story. So, you know, okay. obviously, it's been hushed up anyway. And, um, yeah, and the only other thing, yeah, really, there's, there's a lot of stuff happening uh, online, and I've spent quite, I spent more time this week kind of checking out stuff on Facebook than I normally would uh, and there was a lady, I'm guessing we all, we've probably all seen at this stage, the lady with the yellow vest walking her child in the stroller. Have you seen that one? No. No. Well, there was a lady, and she's just, uh, I think it was in Belgium. It allegedly, allegedly happened in Belgium. Oh, the one that Vin put up. The one that Vin put oh, up, okay, yeah. yeah. She's yeah, walking yeah. along uh, with her child. She has a yellow high-vis vest on. She's not part of any protest. And a lot of people do when you're going out walking of an evening. Uh, they will put on something uh, reflective, you know, for so you can be seen in traffic. This woman had one on, and she, uh, she was surrounded by, I think it was six police officers in this street in Belgium. And they basically asked, asked her to remove the vest. She refused. So she was arrested. You see, her, you actually see her getting arrested and bundled into a van. Vin actually did a, an expose on this during the week. And I just kind of, I looked at it myself and I said, uh, it could be genuine or it could be staged. It could be something that could easily be staged. You know, so you get up there on the internet and, you know, as people do. So I, I made a comment on one of the, one of the, uh, videos just to say that is it genuine or is it stage and a chap did come back uh, the name of Joe Joe said it was 100% correct and he confirmed it because he uploaded it well he said he posted the video so I actually got back to him and I haven't heard the reply yet but I got back to Joe and I said right you uploaded the video but did you actually record the video so if he comes back and says he recorded the video then no, it's obviously true um, but I mean is that the way it's going so if you're out walking your dog now and you have a, a yellow high vis vest on then even though you're walking your dog, miles away from any protest, you can now be arrested. I didn't, didn't realise it was an arrestable offence. The fashion police, that's what it is. It is the fashion police. It's getting ridiculous, but, you know, the push is on. The reason why the push is on is because they're getting desperate. People are waking up in mass, and they're realising they're seeing through what, what, what's going on. Yeah. Um, they're seeing through what the system's trying to do. And we've said this before. People are waking up, and they just they're trying to speed things up um, because they're running out of time. We can play the long game, they can't, so they're trying to speed things up, and that's what's going on. Um, But it's not going to work because they're following an old program that's out of date and it's not going to work. You know, we don't have leaders in government. We have followers. And they follow Leo, and Leo follows somebody else, and the person above that person follows somebody else. This is what it's all about. They're all followers, and they're all following an old program which now doesn't exist. And they don't know what to do, so they're just following that because they've nothing else that can they can they can do. 
Um, so, um, and this is why the system is the way it is and what's going on. Um, so, anyway, is that your week? That's it, done with us, it how's yours? Okay, not too bad. Uh, before we bring Tom on, just a couple of things. Last week I mentioned uh, a, few, a few techie things that went wrong. Um, and, you know, uh, other people have gotten in touch and said they uh, had experienced a number of things as well happening. Um, and they can't explain. So, I don't know, maybe it's some astrological movement somewhere or movement of energies. I haven't a clue. But um, talk about things going wrong. Um, I bought my car in for the NCT during the week, as you do, and I was expecting it to fail, obviously, and they turn around and they go, yeah, it's failed on X, Y, and Z, you need to get that fixed, bring it back in two weeks on. But unfortunately, in my case, uh, the guy came out and he had a sticker on the car and he says, do not drive this car, or we may call the Gardaí because it's, li- it's potentially dangerous. It's lethal, actually. If the brakes are gone, there's brake fluid everywhere. You've no brakes, and this is gone, that's gone, that's gone, and you need four new tyres. And uh, sorry, but there you go, here's your keys, come back in two weeks' time. So I had to get the AA to pick up the car from the NCT centre and bring it to the mechanic, so it's now with the mechanic at the moment. God knows what's wrong with it, and um, well, we know it's the brakes, other things as well. But there you go, when you have an old car, you always, you never have money because you always put money into the old car. Can I just ask a quickie? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said you'd no brakes, but I'm guessing when you pulled into the park and not on the NCT, you I did. had brakes. You I, had brakes. I, 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 my car was working fine. Right, it was working fine, and the brakes were everything was working. I, I knew that was failing something. Right, it may be a little thing somewhere, and I, the car was working fine. And when they, they gave me the car back, it was in that state. Now the guy was looking very sheepish. So I, you know, I do feel that you know, and this is my own belief and my own opinion that they abused the cars in there. When they go in, I know they have to test them, but I think some guys are probably too much heavy on the old foot um, on, on a few instances. And, um, or maybe, you know, maybe there's more of a conspiracy going on that we don't know of. We won't go into that. But, you know, I know the government don't like old cars, you know. So maybe there's something else going on. And just, just for you, Steve, really I thought I'd mention this. Um, that I went and got myself some corn mints. Because um, I was talking to Steve and his, his, his wife, VA, um, about uh, the vegetarian options. I, d- I tried being a vegetarian for two weeks last year, just to give it a go. And you died. <coughs> I died. <laughs> I died. I was gagging for a burger at the end of it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, no, the food was terrible, but then again, I was cooking it, so it's un- understandable. Um, but uh, Steve's wife said, and I do want to kind of cut down on the carnivore side a little bit. So um, Steve's wife suggested getting corn mints instead of the standard mints. So I went out the other day and I got some corn mints. So I'm going to give that a try and see how it goes and kind of cut down on my, my carnivore behaviour. You know, reduce my meat intake, you know. So you did say to me earlier on you're going to sneak it in, because you do a lot of the cooking in the, in the homestead here. Yeah. You're going to sneak it into I'll the recipes. I'll sneak it into the recipes and see what's, <laughs> see what's said, you know. Um, okay, anyway, there you go. That's my week. Right, we're going to bring our guest on, Tom Ryan. Now, Tom's been on the show before. He did the Open Minds Conference. He did the talk down there. And he was on for 20 minutes telling us all about what he'd be talking about on there. But tonight, the subject's going to be more got to do with the anniversary, uh, uh, Independence Day, which is the 21st of January. And the anniversary, I mean, it's 100 years, um, basically. And what kind of, who the IRB are, um, and the history. And what the uh, the history books tell us, and what the real truth is. So before we bring Tom in, we'll get uh, Steve to read out the bio. Okay, we'll start off. Um, Tom Ryan is an internationally renowned master hypnotherapist, lecturer and trainer, based on 40,000 40, hours of clinical experiment experience. Sorry, Tom's dynamic hypnotherapy incorporates many disciplines, all distilled into a unique and dynamic new approach. Experience for yourself the fastest therapy in the world with Tom's powerful process. You can stop smoking, eliminate phobias, panic attacks, anxiety, asthma, sleeping problems and much more permanently, all in just one one one-hour session. Tom proves change is instant and permanent. You can experience Tom's accelerated teaching methods and learn how to replace stress and negative programming such as low self-esteem, with a dynamic, positive, life-enhancing way of thinking and living to bring out the magic of your mind and live your full potential. Experience your power now. 
You already possess the most powerful tool in the universe, the human mind. Tom says the mind's potential is infinite. It came without an instruction manual, so very few people know how to use their magical mind powers to experience and live their greater potential. Our mind runs a set of programs and at an unconscious level, like a computer, only infinitely better. Without a manual to manage your mind and its programs, we may experience the stress, stress, fears, anxiety, sleeping problems, diseases and limitations of all kinds. You can now learn to control and manage the miraculous power and potential of your mind in a whole new way. Uh, Tom also joined the IRB by invitation some five years ago. He and Stephen Keane quickly set up an IRB branch in Clonmel. It is now the largest, most active and most successful branch in Ireland. Tom Stephen, Stephen McGrath, IRB Vice President, then set up branches in Turles, Limerick and Stephen set up a branch in Lisrona. Tom McGrath then set up a branch in Rathkeel and presently Thomas McCormick are setting up a Cork City branch. Branches are planned for all 32 counties within 2019. Tom had been a member of the Munster Council and the Supreme Council of the IRB prior to his election as president. At the 2018 AGM held in Hayes Hotel in Turles, Tom was elected as president of the IRB and Tom McGrath was re-elected as vice president. Very good. Good evening, Tom. How are you? I'm delighted to hear you. I'm fine. I'm very well. I just realised that I was back too long. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. We, you want to see some of the bios that we get in. They're very long. We have to chop them down. Um, listen, good evening and thanks for coming on. Now, we're coming up to the anniversary. It's 100 years since 1919, which is the first stall era in, in the Mansion House. And um, a lot of people, especially our international listeners, will probably say, well, who are the IRB? What's that all about? Um, and, uh, you know, what is the Irish history? And, 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 you know, are they still... Well, a lot of people, even Irish people, might even say, are you telling me the IRB is still going? So can you give us some background as to who the IRB are? And, you know, um, we'll take it from there. Well, the IRB was founded in 1857, 1859, by James Stevens, which Kenny man. Uh, he'd been a young Irelander before that and was involved in skirmishes with the British down in February. And uh, the IRB flourished and had up to 30,000, 40, 50, 60,000 members in the country. And it had thousands of members in Scotland, the UK. And they set up um, a sister organization in the United States called the Fenian Brotherhood. Uh, w- w- the British latched onto that name and used it like the way terrorists use it used today. And even if you go to the north of Ireland at the moment, uh, if some Lyles don't like it, they call you a Fenian bastard. I remember the first time I was in Belfast, I was called a Fenian. He didn't use the bastard part. And I thought he was passing me a compliment. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the Fenian movement is a sep- was a separate movement, but a, a, a brother or a sister movement, if you like, of the IRB. And as far as all through the time since, the 1916 Rising was an IRB organized and instigated operation. The seven signatories who lost their lives were all members of the IRB. Uh, back here in Tipperary, Dan Green, Sean Tracy, and all of those people that we're familiar with, they were all members of the IRB. So most of the volunteer leaders, and later on the IRA leaders, were members of the IRB. And the IRB was a kind of a fatherly organization that looked after and organized them. Now, why is it relevant today? Well, you already mentioned some of that about if Radker isn't leading the country, he's uh, just following a, a 2030 agenda which will flood the country with migrants. And I have nothing against legitimate refugees, but migrants are a different thing. And when you start putting 80 or 100 of them, hundred of them into a village of 50 or 60, it kind of skewers the whole thing. Uh, I didn't mean to get into that, but um, th- that's one of the things. The other thing is what happened in Roscommon, that eviction, and evictions all over the country. There was a horrific eviction in Cork, and then came home from, he was fooled off to a silly court case, to get him out of the house, obviously, about some little misdemeanor of the car. When he came home, his wife and five children were on the side of the road. 
they were thrown out by a bank, I'm not sure which one in this case, but they were the same people who ended up in Ross Common and the same people who ended up evicting people in County Dublin in... Um, Balbriggan, yeah. In Balbriggan, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, these, were, these are terrorists, basically. Uh, but when legitimate people threw them out of the house afterwards, then our Prime Minister, or Taoiseach, or whatever he wants to call himself, um, branded the people who defended the family as, as, as criminals, but the people who were seen on camera and by lots of witnesses, including Gardaí, who did not defend one of their own, uh, assaulting people and did nothing about it. There's something very skewed about what was going on in this country. So we're supposed to be celebrating the 100th anniversary of the first Doyle. Now, they, they call the institution that's going on in Leinster House the Doyle. It's not. It's an Oireachtas. It's a royal Oireachtas. It was founded by King George mm. of England. And in fact, on March the 4th, 14th, 1929, despite entering Linster House, De Valera made a remarkable statement in that free state parliament. He said, I still hold that our right to be regarded as a legitimate government of this country is 40, and that this house itself is 40. You have, dispute, you have secured a de facto position. He accused the free state of having brought up a coup d'etat in the summer of 1922. I call that a counter-revolution financed and run and armed by the British to do what they couldn't do. Mm. Now, the letter went on. Those who have continued on that organization, which we left, which we have left, can claim exactly the same continuity that we claimed up to 1925. They can do it. He was talking about the, the Republicans that continued at that stage. Now, then there was the rumor that went out that the IRB discontinued in 1924. Well, it had split into two when the split came about, and part of it went into the Free State Army, and they did disband in 1924. Uh, Liam Lynch, the head of the, um, the Republican uh, Army that fought them, he called the IRB a splendid organization, and the IRB never disbanded. And uh, it's been very quiet for the last 50 odd years. And in fact, we're the same president for all of most of those, Billy Maguire. And Billy turns the sovereign state on the 21st of January every year. It's a family tradition going back to when his, I think it was his uncle, his granduncle, first turned it on the same day that the Doyle opened on the 21st of January 1919. And it's a way of uh, establishing the people's personal sovereignty. Well, each person is born sovereign anyway, and we don't need any symbolism to establish that. But that sovereignty is taken away, and we're presented with a constitution. Now, the constitution we're presented with is the 1937 constitution. That constitution has no legitimacy. Why? Because there was never a referendum. And people would say, hold on, there was. No, there was not. There was a plebiscite. Because there was an existent constitution, the 1919 constitution, which was organized in the first soil, and that was never rescinded. Because it couldn't be, because King George had split the country into two at this stage, and there was an assembly in Northern Ireland, and there was a, uh, an assembly created in the South, which we lived on the Free State, and they needed a 32 county mandate to change or to eliminate that constitution. They couldn't do that. And then they couldn't hold a, um, a referendum to have a, tw a free state constitution and a 26 county constitution because there was already a constitution there. So he conned the people with a plebiscite masquerading as a constitution. And a plebiscite in law has no more standing than an opinion poll in a Sunday newspaper. Mm. So we have a Sunday newspaper opinion poll ref, ref, um, excuse for a referendum, really called the plebiscite, which brought about the 1937 constitution. Now, up to that, even the British instituted 1922 constitution, which supplanted the um, legitimate constitution, but never got rid of it, of the 1919 constitution, both of those previous constitutions recognized that the land, the minerals, the water, the oil, or whatever else was found, belonged to the people. 
In the 1937 Constitution, that was theft. They said that those things belonged to the state, not the people. Now, the state is nothing more than a fiction created by the people who run the country from Leinster House. But they control all those things. So people like um, Ray Burke could come along and sell mineral rights for wherever he got into his arse pocket. And they could sell off the rights of the gas down on the carbide field in, in, in Mayo and do all those kind of things legitimately because they had stolen those from the people and they still steal them from the people. And the people have been robbed blind by all kinds of illegitimate taxes to this day. And that's how they can bring about uh, this kind of attempted privatization of water and property taxes and all those kind of things. It's based on illegitimacy. Okay. Let me just get back to the original question because I I totally agree with what you're saying there. Um, I mean, I would kind of be... uh, My belief would be the real constitution of the country is the 1919 constitution, especially the fact they had direct democracy in it. And they knew what they were doing when they did it, which makes sense. And obviously they took it out of the the two constitutions because they don't want people having the power. But with with the the IRB... What is your purpose? I mean, you said you were quiet for about 50 years. What's your purpose now? What, you, what are, you, are you planning to do stuff or what, what's behind it? Are you, uh, you know, well, why, why, do, why do you get together and why are these groups around the country? What's the plan of attack? Well, the plan of attack is very simple. To organize enough groups around the country to reestablish the true Irish Republic that was illegitimately taken away in, 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 in what was called the Civil War, the Counter, Counter-Revolution. To do that, we've got to build up members. And the interesting thing was there was a thought for a long time that people weren't interested, but people are very interested. We have no problem setting up branches. Even the um, bio that I sent to you is, is out of date in that in the last 10 days, a new branch has been set up in Cove, County Cork. Mm. And two more branches are being set up in County Cork uh, as I speak and will be up and running in the next 10 days. So it, it, it's it's... Catching on almost like the yellow um, tops in France at an incredible rate because people are terribly unhappy with the way the state is behaving. True, yeah. And they're not happy with its legitimacy. And this state has signed us up to join a European uh, army. That's totally illegitimate. That should be put to the people. Yeah. Totally. Well, again, if we had if we had direct democracy from our, the original 1919 constitution, the government wouldn't have even bothered to ask us about the bank bailout because people would have said no. And uh, that's why we should have it in our constitution. Absolutely. Now, you, yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. Now, um, you're saying that obviously a lot of people have an interest in um, joining... What is the process to join the IRB? It's very, very simple. You come along and you become a member. You don't even have to sign anything. You, you just have to be accepted by two existing members as legitimate to join. Okay. Because you said on your, you your bio here that you are invited. Is there something that got to do with the difference? Do you have to be invited by the two members um, to join? Uh, you don't have to be invited by anybody to join. You can come along, but you have to be nominated by two members. Okay, okay, right. Okay. And is, would, you, would you call this a Republican movement? Very much so, yeah. Right, okay. Um, d- now, I know, obviously, uh, I know Billy. I always kind of thought Billy was the vice president or the president of the, the IRB. Um, so I was surprised when I got your bio and you said you were the president. Now... Um, what I remember, well, I've heard a couple of interviews with um, Billy in the past, um, and obviously we have, what's his name? I, I don't even know, I forget. Who's their president, well, so-called president now at the oh, moment? Michael, Michael D. Higgins. Michael D. Higgins. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's how forgetful the guy is, right? Yeah. He's classed as the president, and we always say that he has no power. He's only a figurehead for the country, but technically he's probably not the real president. If you're... If you've been voted in as the president, or when, as when Billy was in as the president, what, does that give you any power, or is that just a figurehead thing, or what is it? Uh, it? It gives you representative power, but the Supreme Council...
Council of the IRB, from its foundation to the present day, is the governing body of the IRB. Mm. And that has a number of people from all four provinces, and they would nominate the president for president, and the, then the people in general at the AGM would vote one way or another, and that's basically how it happens. But um, the president is subject to the people that have voted him in, and he's particularly subject to the Supreme Council to carry out their requirements. And they have a legitimate right to fire him at any time if he doesn't um, behave, if you like, so to speak, or if he diverts off in some other direction. So that they are the supreme authority of the IRB. The president is the figurehead who carries out their um, requirements, if you like. Okay. And how does this work with, uh, I mean, are you going to have a political party set up representing the IRB? Are you a political movement or is it just a grassroots people movement? Uh, it's not a political movement. Politics in this country, I don't care what party they're in, is dirty and filthy to the core. Uh, it's, it's a populist movement. We continue to be a populist movement. And just like Sinn Féin grew out of the IRB way back in 1913 when it was set up, uh, then political movements of a new type that will be clean can be set up out of this. But at the moment, it's a populist movement to rally the people, to give the people leadership, to give them hope, to give them inspiration, and to give them the opportunity to have a voice. Because they, every four or five years, vote for treated dumb or treated twice as dumb. Yeah, that's and very good. And they get treated dumb and treated dumber, dumber in, mm. who have made a lot of promises and they never honour those promises. Yeah. Well, since 1922, it's mainly been the two parties over the nearly 100 years, give or take, and yet the country's still in a state. I mean, does that, te does that not tell people something? It does, but they have had this awful feeling that they have had nothing else to to vote for, if you like, or to, to, um, to give themselves a sense of some kind of attachment or feeling. And then they were in, these guys would come around and they would have beautiful literature and they would make fantastic presentations and they would lovely adverts on and make speeches. And they'd start to get belief in them because the crowd that were in power had let them down in every shape and form. They'd elect a new crowd and they'd do exactly what the crowd before them did. Now this time around, it's got more interesting because the two illegitimate operators are, are hand in glove together. I mean, Mihal Martin is backing up Varadkar at, at every turn, and he's afraid to do anything else because the man has no spines. Mm. Well, look, they, none, none, none of them have any spines. I mean, the whole idea is that if you're in the opposition party, you jump up and down about this should be done and that should be done. As soon as they get in power, they never do anything and they switch roles. And then the role that the party that was in power goes to opposition and they say the same things and the same thing over and over and over again. I'm surprised people don't see this program. At the beginning to now. That's why the, the grassroots... Um interest in the IRB is getting so strong and people are getting so interested in it. There's a lot going on that I'm not uh, at liberty to talk about at the moment, but there will be massive changes, I promise you. And I absolutely support the people that defended the people in Roscommon as president of the IRB, I'm saying that. Yeah. And if there's any more evictions, I would totally, completely support the people that will fight those evictions in any way, shape, or form, because it must stop now. We bailed out the banks, and now the banks are hammering the people, and we have totally illegitimate uh, judiciary who will do whatever the banks say because they're so bloody compromised themselves. Yeah. yeah. So the, 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 the people are in a terrible state, and the people need leadership, and we're going to offer them that leadership, and they can form whatever kind of political structures they want after that, because we'll not like, dictate to them like the present regimes are doing. Yeah. I do want to talk to you about the history for our international listeners to mm -hmm. understand the history from 1916 and 1919 and then the 1922. 
um, because obviously we had the 1916 rising and then we had the fourth stall in 1919 and then obviously uh, King George V did a, a quick switcheroo on the old constitution and we had the 19, 1922 constitution but we only had a republic for like three years, what, two, two or three years and then it was, it was switched around again. Do you want to tell us basically what happened from the 1916 up to 1922 because there is international listeners won't know really know the history and it's so important that the reason why we have independence day and um basically uh why you know the irb is now growing in numbers and the the whole republican side is growing again yeah well 1916 rising uh it didn't have the popular support that was expected but the British and their stupidity and their ignorance went and shot the leaders, and that turned the people completely against them. Then they threatened uh, conscription to get the Irish to go and fight for them in their imperial war with Germany. Mm. And that got the people backs up against him again. And then there was a suffragette movement, the ladies' movement, who wanted to vote. And the strongest party in the British House of Commons opposing the women's vote was John Redmond's Irish party. People don't know that. Mm. They were the biggest child of traitors of all time. In fact, John Redmond got 50,000 Irish people killed out in, 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 in Flanders and other places in the First World War by promising they were fighting for the freedom of the small nations, fighting for Belgium. But Belgium was murdering 10 million people in the Congo at the time, mm. you know? Yeah. Now, so in, in then in 1980, in the election, Sinn Féin won 73 of the 105 parliamentary seats in that election, and that established a mandate for the Dáil Éireann. So, um, they, 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 they just rejected the whole British thing, went into the uh, mansion house and set up their own Dáil. Mm. So when the Government of Ireland Act became law on the 23rd of December 1920, it was already out of touch with realities in Ireland. So the long-established demands for home rule had been replaced by an elected parliament. So they were completely out of touch. Now, one thing that's completely forgotten and seldom mentioned uh, in, the, in the things, the British actually then, in May 1921, there was more elections, and there was 128 MPs elected to what they called the House of Commons of Southern Ireland, which returned 124 of them, representing Sinn Féin, who declared themselves ch as TDs, chuck the dollar. And they opted to go to the Doyle Aaron instead. And they assembled the second Doyle Aaron. Then, only four unionist MPs, all representing uh, university graduates, and 15 appointed senators turned up for the state opening of the Parliament of Southern Ireland. And that was held in the Royal College of Science in Dublin, now government buildings, on June 21. Now, as a result, this new legislator, legislator, uh, legislative assembly was, was suspended, shut down, because there was nobody there. So Southern Ireland, they called it, was then ruled directly from Westminster under the Government of Ireland Act. So the provisional government of the Irish Free State then was constituted on the 14th of January 1922 at a meeting of members of Parliament elected for the constituencies, of, the constituencies of Southern Ireland, according to the British. Now, this was convened as a meeting in the House of Commons of Southern Ireland, not as a meeting of Dáil Éireann. It instead was convened by Arthur Griffith as chairman of the Irish delegation of plenipotentiaries, who had signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty, which wasn't a treaty, because a treaty can only be signed by two sovereign states who recognize each other as such. And the British didn't recognize us as a sovereign state, they didn't recognize us as a state at all. They recognized us as a, a rump of the British Empire causing them trouble, causing them troubles like a temple in their backside. Mm. So there was no Anglo-Irish Treaty, there was an agreement. Now the British Parliament then established the Irish Free State and passed the Irish Free State Const uh, Constitutional Provisions Act 1922, which got it going. So new elections were held in June 1922 and were followed by meetings of the third Dáil, which worked as a constitutional assembly. So it wasn't really legitimate, the third Dáil. It, it, it considered itself a constitutional assembly 
to draft up legislation for the Irish Free State, Sir State Aaron, for the purpose of British law. So the, 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 the Irish people who had elected those, the first and second dolls, were now absorbed by the, the, the third bunch of them. Basically, I'm saying you cannot trust any politicians. Because the third doll politicians wanted to create this Irish Free State Constitution in 1922. And this new state was created by the British. On December the 6th, 1922, by King George mm. of England. Now, that's what they're calling Dáil Éireann in Minster House now. It's not Dáil Éireann. It was an institution created by a House of Commons Act under the jurisdiction of King George. So how can that be a Dáil Éireann? It's not. Most of the time, they don't use the term Dáil Éireann anymore. They're too embarrassed. They call it the Oireachtas. Now, Republicans viewed the Anglo-Irish Treaty as a complete sellout. Now, although the duty, it was endorsed by the majority of TVs of the second doll, Republicans argued that the vote was invalid as prior to their election, all TVs had taken a solemn oath to defend the Irish Republic. So they were in breach of that oath when they voted anything else. And the people could not possibly express their true desires on the treaty imposed by the British under the threat of immediate and terrible war which were the words of Light George. So the Republicans didn't accept that. They were let down by the politicians, and Light George had a gun barrel to their head. And um, Dáil Éireann then, after a number of meetings, was declared an illegal assembly in September 19 by the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. So the British were still running the show. Okay, so... That's let's not the version of history we were taught in school. Exactly. So let's just clarify that for our international listeners. I'm going to try and break it down for them. And basically, obviously we had uh, the War of Independence and we had uh, the 1916 Rising. And in the 1919, the first doll, the first government, made a get-together in the Mansion House. It happened on mm. uh, the 21st of uh, okay. January 1919. And that was when Ireland was a republic. And then by 1922, um, King George V did a switcheroonie, and then mm -hmm. they, they brought out the, the second constitution, which was under King George V. So we only had a republic, although we're called the Republic of Ireland, basically we're still under home rule, technically, by the UK, because of what happened in 1922. So even though they had the new constitution in 1937... Um, all the, it does a few things obviously removed from the constitution one of them was direct democracy and the other one was obviously recall I think that was in it as well and, um, and basically so we are still under UK rule although we have home rule so we have a provisional government we don't have a real government we have a provisional government and my understanding also is that when you go into the court and you see the harp behind the judge unless there's an EIRE underneath you're in a corporation and you're not in a proper court. You are in a corporation, yes. And in fact, it's no longer a provisional government. It's a private corporation registered in the United States of America. Okay. Um, it's a British registered corporation in the United States of America. That's right. I, I think that was said on when, when we were down in... In 2017, when we went to the Open Minds Conference, I was down there, we weren't doing a talk, I was just down there as a guest of Trevor, and there was a speaker up on the stage, and I'm not too sure who it was, but they actually had the proper documentation to say that everything has been incorporated in Ireland, and that basically were, it were a corporate, it's a corporation. I mean, even the Gardaí are registered on Dun & Bradstreet as a registered business. Yeah, and, and so are all the departments of state. Yes, they're there as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. including the department of so-called tea shop. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is what people need to understand, that we are in a corporation, and the TDs are not TDs, they're employees, and Leo Vradka is the CEO, and they, he's obviously being dictated to. And, and, and I don't know, would we be classed as a fascist country now with the banks basically controlling everything? Uh, it's completely fascist at the moment. In fact, let's look at it a little bit more worldwide. Bigger and bigger corporations 
are swallowing up each other and getting bigger and bigger. Mm. Now, in the Middle Ages, we had a system called feudalism, where the Lord ran everything, and the people underneath, there was the vassals, and then there was the serfs, and then there was the villains, and they had different statuses down along the line. Mm. But what we have now is called feudal corporate, corporatism, a corporate feudalism, if you like, mm. because it's brought back the feudal system, run by corporations rather than run by towns or dukes. So it, it, it's, it's corporations are running the whole thing now, whereas the people elect those towns, then the corporations dictate to them. The banks have told the government, we need money, bail us out or else. Yeah. And the government buckle and they give them the money. Then the banks start abusing the people for the money they've already been given to throw them out of their houses and the government supports them. Mm. The, 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 the judiciary supports them. That's when law is completely illegitimate. Yeah. And the law in this country at the moment is completely illegitimate, north and south. Mm. We have two failed states as a result of what King George did in 1922. Mm. And that's what we have today. And we've got to get rid of both of them. And there's some unionists now coming around to this way of thinking. I mean, you may have seen the unionist guy who was up saying that he would be down and he would tie himself to the gates of Ross Common to keep those terrorists out. Yeah, I've seen the video. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And th th there's a few more like him. And we're beginning to have talk to them now. And they're very interesting and amazing people. Well, the thing is, is that we mentioned this last week. We had Ben Gilroy on the show last week. And we said this on the show that it, it was very easy on your initial understanding of what you, where you see what was going on at Strokestown and this uh, gang coming down um, from the north. Um, it, there was this kind of underlying, it was like sectarianism was going to happen again because of the anger and the history of Ireland. But then, when you kind of pull back, we talked about this, they love the divide and conquer. They love doing these programs and that's yeah, exactly okay. what they, we, I mean, we've said this before on the show, the government, the, 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 the last port of call for them when all else fails is to try and bring in martial law and try and have people fighting against each other because if they declare martial law, they'll have complete control, they'll bring out the army. Even if it's a European army, they can bring over. So we have to be aware that going down that road and fighting between each other and falling for the Divide and Conquer programs, we have to think about it and we have to stop ourselves because they, this is the game they play. I mean, you know, Tom, you're in the game of, you know, psychology and stuff like that. So you know, you know this already, and a lot of people do, that this is how they do it. And we need to be uh, better than them. And so, and a fair play to that chap, I think his name is Tom, I don't know, not to Jim or something, who, who actually came out and did that video and said he would come down with his people and stand there and, and, and stand beside us. Because that's what it's all about. It's the unity of the people against the system. Because it's the system that's the fault. Yeah, well, people like him have called their bluff. And we'll respond to people like him, and we're going to go and meet him and his people. With our hands held out in admiration to them. Mm. Because while they may be loyalists and unionists and things like that, they're honest, they're decent, they're honourable people. They're not terrorists. There is a terrorist element there in Northern Ireland. There can be terrorist element here or anywhere else. Mm. But the majority of law-abiding unionists are not terrorists. And they're being let down so much by the British government at the moment that they're being driven into our, our arms, if you like. And if we treat them with the respect that they're entitled to and deserve, they will reciprocate with us. So I believe that we can achieve a 32-county genuine republic again, separate from anything that either the British or the, 32 count, or the, or the 26th county junta have in mind, because it's not a true parliament in Dublin. It's a, it's a junta. It's a dirty little club with a bunch of parasites eating out of the trough and leaving as little as possible for anybody else and stealing from everybody else. Yeah, I'm bringing in more taxes. Carbon taxes, property charges, water charges, selling off our water. I mean, when are they going to stop? As soon as they can tax fresh air. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They, they, know, it's crazy. There's no end to their greed. What they need all this money for, I don't know. Now, so where does the money go? 
Well, they publish these figures each year called the, um, oh, what do they call them? Um, well, let me just jump in there. Um, yeah. What are, are you thinking about that? Something that we're going to, we were going to mention at the end of the show, but maybe it's something to uh, mention now. Um, uh, Thomas uh, Williams, who people know, regular listeners know, uh, on Thomas' show, he did mention in America they're bringing out a bill, they're trying to get a bill passed called um, HR, let me just tell you now what it is, um, it's called a HR 25 bill. And basically what it means is they're going to do away with the IRS, the Inland Revenue in America. Because the IRS in America is not American, number one. And number two, all the money that goes to the IRS does not go to the American people, right? It goes to other people. It goes to the cabal and the elite, all right? So this HR 25 that is going to be um, hopefully coming in, if anybody votes against it, then they're voting against the people. And what we need to do is try and do the same thing because, Tom, I'm sure you've seen the paperwork where Josephine Feely stated three times that we are, um, we are taxed by consent. And I'm sure, Tom, you, we, you will probably know the history of tax, that after the, the War of Independence and what happened, they, they brought in tax as a voluntary system and they said we need you to pay tax to help rebuild Ireland but it was never brought into law so so tax on our labour was never um, uh, uh, legally uh, binding and, and it's still not and it's still not and Josephine Feely confirmed that in the talk she did to the McGill Summer School when three times she stated categorically that tax we are taxed by consent now when did we consent well the, what we did is we didn't say no and if we didn't say no, then the answer must be yes. Yeah. Well, when each person fills up a tax uh, a revenue, what you call it, at the end of the year, th that is accepted as their consent, and they're conned into doing that. Now, uh, we have another problem called the Central Bank. The Central Bank is owned by the Bank of Ireland, an allied Irish bank, and a few more corporations. In 1942, Sean Keo Kelly produced this Central Bank um, what would we call it um, um, act mm. and there was when it was passed there was only five members in the doll to pass it now the doll requires as they called it the doll the Iraqis requires a minimum of 20 people for to have a quorum so the passing of the act for the um the, 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 the central bank is totally illegitimate, and the central bank, therefore, is totally illegitimate, and everything it does is totally illegitimate. Now, we're told that the central bank is there to, um, to, to, to be the controlling factor over the banks. So how can it be the controlling factor over the banks when the banks actually own it? Mm. You know, it's not a government institution. It's a banker's institution. Yeah. It's their own institution. Mm. Exactly. And, of course, we know, I mean, that's why the Yellow uh, Vest movement in France have now said they're going to go for the banks and withdraw your money in the banks. And what the, the banks have done over in France is they're now either closing down the ATMs or limiting your withdrawal amount to 50 euros. Uh, they've already done that here. You try and get out 5,000 euros out of the bank. Yeah. You had 5,000 euros in the bank. Yeah. Now, we... So, no, because we, we know by, uh, by the people that we've been interviewing who have a, an inside track and things uh, th that the banks, the banks don't have any money. They're all insolvent and they're using what's called mirrored accounts. Um, and just to kind of, and this is why there's a big asset grab at the moment with the banks. They're trying to get more assets and more liquidity. So they're yeah. selling off um, all these mortgages and pennies off the pound to the vulture funds so they can have some liquidity and assets on the books. So when you go to the um, ECB, they can go, look, we have all these. We're trading fine and we're not insolvent. Um, yeah. But it's all a rouge. It is totally. It brings back the question. Where did all the money that the government gave them in the bailout go to? Well, I mean, we can, we can only guess where it went to. 
we can only guess, but when the, uh, after the stock uh, market crash in 1929, I believe, um, the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, I think that's the right pronunciation, was brought in to separate commercial loans from residential loans, but then um, in 1999, I think, Bill Clinton signed it back, back in. And that's what really screwed us, because mm. they mixed the loans, commercial loans, in with the residential loans. But again, that was an odious debt, and we shouldn't have paid that, because we had no contract to actually pay it. And this is no. why we need direct democracy back in. Mm. I mean, the government bailed out private institutions. The banks had no right, no right to do that whatsoever. That was a horrific thing. The second thing is they paid bondholders money that they had no contract with either. So they bent over backwards and let themselves get totally screwed by the banks and the bondholders. So who are they working for? Well, They're not working for the people who elected them. No. Well, you know, Tom, that some of these um, the, the solicitors and barristers and TDs are up to the eyes, their eyes in debt because of greed and buying That's properties. It. And, of course, what the bank would say is, if you don't do what you're told, we're going to pull in them loans and we're going to sort you out. Yeah, absolutely, and they pull in the loans and they do what the banks tell them. Yeah, the yeah. banks say jump, and they say how high would you like us to jump? Yeah, exactly, and and that's the and that's the control system that's in place at the moment that needs to change. Now we do have a, a number of questions that have come in from our listeners, so I'm going to pass you over to Steve, who's been very quiet and not jumping in saying anything. Uh, no problem. Good interview, Steve. Is it? <laughs> it's, uh, it's very riveting listening. I have to say, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people are commenting on the both of the chat rooms there. So yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic information. Um, okay, I'm going to just uh, go with a comment first from Graham. Graham says taxes are legal for corporations only. Men and women are not liable for taxes. We have heard that before. Hundred um, percent correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He also says, uh, relating to Ireland, etc., being a corporation, if it's a corporation, they must use your consent for benefits and liabilities to apply to the man or woman. Most people agreed or consented by tacit acquiescence. Uh, that's the elephant in the room, he says. Do you want to comment on that one, Tom? He's perfectly right. Uh, when we vote, in fact, that's the first form of consent. When we fill up our tax forms, that's the second form of consent. Uh, any interaction with the government is a form of consent. For example, if you go through the M50 toll booth and you forget to give them your one and a half euros or three euros or whatever it is, uh, next thing is a firm of solicitors, Dallin Kerry, is going to look for about 300 euros off you. Well, I had this problem with them a couple of years ago, and I wrote back and I said, just show me where I have had a contract with you to give you anything for any reason under any circumstances. Show me the contract. They failed to show me the contract, and I threatened to sue them for 100,000 euros, and I haven't heard any more since after. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you, here's the thing, uh, Tom, regarding that. If you go to the NRA, uh, or NRA website, which is the National Road Association, they say that non-payment of the toll will be um, treated as a uh, contract, um, no, I think it's something like the wording is something like contract debt, n normal contract debt, and they, they will chase after you. Um, they will chase after you, but unless you contract with them when they chase after you, they have no further recourse. Okay, so when you when this happened, just for interest, when you got the letter off the sister, you just sent them a fee for the contract? No, I, I first was very nice to them. I said, thank you very much for your letter. Uh, please show me my wedding signature and any contract I have with you in relation to this and indeed any other matter. And uh, if you can show me that, I'd be more than happy to pay you. Okay. So I'm always acting on her. And th then they just sent me back a threat, totally ignoring that. And then I decided to threaten them for a lot more. So that's where it ended. Okay. And then they stopped. They, they're a shower of bullies. Yeah. They're a shower of criminals. Because if the toll booth is 150 or 3 euros, depending on whatever kind of uh, vehicle you have, uh, to turn that into 300 euros within a couple of months has no legitimacy whatsoever. It's got nothing to do with putting interest rates on, on it because you couldn't calculate interest rates up at that rate at that level. Uh, unless you've gone completely mad. So they're criminals. I, I call them criminals, and I say to them, no, you are criminals. 
Okay, Tom, we have a caller. Um, we have actually Chris Fogarty, uh, which I was going to uh, mention actually on the show because I'm currently reading his book. And Chris is on the line and he has a question for you. Um, yeah. So we can bring him on. Um, hang on a minute there. Do you want to press that button, Steve? We have to... Which one? Yeah, that one. This one? Yeah. That says drop. No, no, go ahead. Oh, no, hang on, no, no, that one. Yeah. Okay, and we just bring up this. Now, Chris, can you hear us? Yes. Hi, Chris, how are you doing? You have um, Tom, who obviously was in an interview with. Do you have a question for Tom? Uh, yes. Uh, there's another tragedy is underway. Uh, from Chicago, it's a very long distance to be aware of what's everything that's going on. But there seems to have been a coup at the IRB. The reason I can say that from here is that there were shocking accusations made against a number of the officers, at least one, that have been unsupported. There has been no evidence whatever brought forward. And uh, the president, Billy McGuire, seems to have no position in this new organization. In other words, this new group did not join the IRB. They evidently joined... Uh, claims to have joined in such numbers that they voted themselves into office and removed the actual officers and membership from membership. It's a very, it's a shocking and sad state for Ireland. Um, I must, I have to take this moment to say there's a question as to who are actually even members. Those who are now speaking for the IRB are, it's even dubious as to whether there are even members of the IRB. My wife and I donated a banner to the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, that's the, on the banner. And it is now in the hands of the cool people. It should belong to the people, to Billy Maguire and those who remain faithful to the IRB. And so I'm, I'm demanding of, of Mr. Tom Ryan that, that he make sure to return the banner that my wife and I gave to Billy Maguire and the two IRB back to them, along with the other artifacts that belong to the IRB. And thank you very much. Okay, well, Tom, do you want to reply to Chris about that? I would be delighted to reply to that. And I have replied to Chris already uh, with emails, and he seems to have ignored them completely. Now, if we want to get into the dirt of the situation, which I hadn't intended to do, uh, Billy Maguire was president of the IRB for some 55 years, and he kept the thing going through thick and thin when things were bad. But he didn't ever set up any more branches, until we set up the branch in Tranmel, the one I mentioned. Now, uh, about five or six years ago, a committee was set up to run the IRB, and um, they never held any meetings. They were supposed to hold monthly meetings. Now, uh, about three years ago, some of those members in Dublin were sending Billy Maguire information about monthly meetings. Now, I was a member of that committee. Mick O'Reilly and Carp was a member of that committee. Rabard um, in, in, in Carlo was a member of that committee and Tom McGrath was a member of that committee members, more than half of the committee were never invited to members of the committee, so the, the committee had no legitimacy so we had a vote of no confidence in that committee in Clanmel, at the Clanmel branch but we invited all other branches to attend which they did, and we had an anonymous vote of no confidence in the committee and Billy Maguire had promised to honor whatever vote was taken by the people, and we sent him a copy of all the information on that, and he ignored it and went with the four people in Dublin who claimed to be running the whole thing. They're the ones who had a little coup d'etat quietly going on themselves. Now, uh, Chris says he donated uh, this banner to the IRB. Now, if he wants it back, he can have it. If he didn't give it with a good heart to the IRB, he can shove it where Jack shoved the rusty shilling. Because it was given to the IRB, not to some specific members that he seems to be under the impression that there's a coup against. There isn't a coup against. They were deposed for abusing the IRB, for not holding meetings, for ignoring the membership of the IRB, for ignoring the Supreme Council, for ignoring the Monster Council and all the other leg legitimate arms of the IRB, and Billy Maguire backed them up. We invited them all to the last AGM. They didn't turn up. 
If they didn't turn up, they have no say. They ignored the legitimate right that they had to turn up and to vote and to bring enough members to vote whatever they wanted. They didn't even turn we up. We have seen no. all this before. They're they're crying when the Jerry government. Adams sold out, he sent a number of young men to the states. They joined Clan okay, McGill I'm in such numbers as to take over. They voted okay, on Clan on, on, on. whatever property they, the, the, the various branches had, and they liquidated them and sold them, sold the proceeds, okay. the proceeds over to Jerry Adams. We've seen this happen before. When they came to Chicago, they were blocked from joining. Okay, God, 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 no Tom, for this kind Tom. Of coup d'etat. If, any, if this new group had any respect for, for the, for the Tom, IRB Chris, Chris. and for uh, those who, who kept it going all these years, they would be honored members of the new group. They would not have been put into, they would not have been disappeared. Okay, hang on, hang on. Chris, Chris, Chris and Tom, hang on, hang on a minute, guys. Nobody's going to hear anything if you're talking over each other, all right? Now, um, obviously you had what you had to say there, Tom. Chris, you go ahead and say what you have to say, but please, let's kind of, you know, have a bit of a conversation ping pong here, rather yeah, than talking over each other. Leave Jerry Adams out of it. He's got nothing to do with us. We have nothing to do with him. We don't recognize him. Never did, never had, and never will. Okay, Chris, do you want to uh, talk to Tom? Yes, we've seen the pattern before. Any group who comes in and says they're going to join an organization, if they are legitimate, they will become hardworking members and in time become officers. They will not, they will not form a coup and, and declare that the people who have kept it going all these years are non-persons, not even members, no longer officers and not even members. That takes a special kind of doing. And I must say, to use the lies, to use the accusation, against a key member of the legitimate IRB and then to never try to never try to uh, uh, prove, prove that just unsupported accusations that have no basis no basis in reality that indicates to me that the whole coup is nothing but a coup there okay. it, it is based okay. upon falsehood you've had your say, you've had your say. Okay. now it's my turn can you support this statement you've made about some allegation about some member, because I'm not aware of it. Hello? Chris? What statement? Yes, you of course, it. I have it on email. Yeah, who are you talking about? Well, I'm, I'm loath to, to mention names on air. Uh, it's a sad thing. Oh, by the, oh, I see what you're doing. Yes, the person who made the accusations is not a member, but he made it in conjunction with an officer of the coup group. And it was the officer of the coup group who defended the person who made the accusations. With all due respect, Chris, that's bullshit. And you're talking through the side of your mouth. And I'm absolutely surprised. As a man who has written a wonderful book, about the, the Holocaust and all of that, and to, to, to be coming out of that crap. I, I'm absolutely astonished, way beyond that, belief. That's, that's your language, it's not mine. Within, within the IRB, it's your attempt to do so, and your attempt to undermine the IRB, and your attempt to, to, to destroy the legitimacy of the IRB, who's been down there since 1859, and how dare you? Okay, well, that's. I, th I think Any legitimate attempt to part participate and strengthen the IRB would I not result in, in the disappearance of, of, of the officers of the IRB. Years, I was not a member of any coup of any description at any time, and the people you're talking about didn't even have the manners to turn up to the AGM. Well, listen, that's. They're we, we, from the outside, and they're using you as a mouthpiece, Chris, and you're a willing mouthpiece for them. And it's stupid yep. mouthpiece. Well, all, I, all I know is the, are the, are the uh, emails I've gotten from your, one of your officers in support of the accusations. Well, listen, can, uh, I listen, that's. I, I think. I don't even know what you're talking about. I sent you, I sent you all the details in my own email, and you decided to totally ignore them. Can we take this offline, guys? Because, I mean, we can talk about this all night, and I don't think we're going to get a, a, a solution tonight on air. Um, can, I just, can we just say we agree to disagree for now? 
and that's something that you guys sure. have to that's sort out. That's a civilized way to handle it, indeed. Yeah, if, if, I think that would be... Much. That's no problem. It's not very civilized to come along and make accusations against the legitimate IRB, like Chris has just done. I'm shocked at him, and he should be ashamed of himself. Okay, well, listen, I think that we could take this off air, and, you know, you, you two might have to sort it out for there. Chris, we do appreciate you phoning in, and, you know, obviously that's your opinion on how you feel about things. That's fine. Um, but it's something that I think... It's very that important that truth be told, and so thank you very much. You've got a wonderful radio show, and I hope you have many years of, of great contributions of the kind that you are now making. Thank you very much. No Bye. problem, Chris. Thanks for Chris phoning in. completely ignore the truth up to now. I can send you all the emails that he sent and we sent to him, and they're there for the public to see, and I'd be happy to send them to you. Because we're hiding nothing. Okay, well, listen, Tom, we can't, you know, obviously we don't know about what's going on, so we can't comment on this. That's something I think you have to sort out with Chris or whoever. Um, no, I don't have to sort out with anything with Chris. He's not a member of the IRB, and he's talking to his backside. Okay, well, funny enough, talking about membership, we have a question from one of our listeners, and they're in the UK, and they asked us, um, how do you become a member of the IRB if you're in the UK? At the moment, we don't have any branches there, but if they can get enough people or a few people around them, we'll be happy to go over and help them to set up a membership in the UK. We're presently doing the same with the group in Canada. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Um, do I see if you've got more questions there for Tom? Yeah, we do have more questions. Um, just in relation to taxation, Chris is wondering, uh, can I ask Tom what would happen if a self-employed person decided not to make a tax return and decline consent? Well, they'll do everything in their power, I I'm, I'm not sure, but I would assume they'll do everything in their power to, 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 to get him to contract the consent some way with them. Uh, I know of one man who did that, and they didn't do anything about it, but they managed to get the banks to have him evicted out of his house. Right. So, I mean, obviously, the, obviously, if you don't play their game by their rules, then they have the clout to uh, obviously affect other other uh, um, parts of your life. I'm guessing, obviously, if they if they can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the case. that's what that seems to be the game. So it's kind of we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. So I mean, yeah. I mean, does that mean like what you said earlier in relation to the toll, the pay, paying of tolls? Do you still use the road, or was that like was that a one-off situation, or do you continually to use the use the I toll? Don't, I don't continue to use that. I mean, when I go to a toll booth, I'll pay. On this particular occasion, I was going to the airport, and. Um, I didn't have the opportunity because I was going to be out of the country for some time. So um, they, they took advantage of that to, to turn, uh, I think it was three euros into 300 euros or something. And uh, if it had still been the three euros, I'd have happily paid it. See, this is the problem, Tom. Even though we know we're right regarding the law, they will never let you get away with it. You were lucky that time. But generally they won't let you get away with it because they know that if some if one person gets away with it and it sets a precedent then everybody's going to be doing it yeah i agree with you on that one that's what's, that's what's happening so that's why we've got to take back the legitimacy of the country from them and we have to set up a powerful organization without anybody from the outside trying to describe it I wonder, is Chris now a British agent or something like that? Well, look, we don't know what's going on, so we can't really comment, and the best thing to do well, is... He, to he made some statements there, but I have no idea what he's talking about, about the, he said, she said, they said, I said, we don't do, and we don't play those soap operas and those silly little things like that, and I won't tolerate it from Chris or anybody else. Okay. Well, uh, maybe you need to hook up with Chris or whoever and find out what the story no, is. And I, just... behave, I have no intention of hooking up with him. Mm. Okay. Uh, well, we, I mean, that, that was appalling. Mm. Well, again, you know, we, we don't know what's going on, so we can't really comment. We do have more questions for you. Um, hang on a minute, Steve. Yes, we do. Um, Peter says, question, if George Bush and the Clintons and all the rest go to jail, will they go to a normal jail or will it be home detention? I'm not sure whether that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight. 
Um, if that if that if that was if if Leo Vodka, I think they'll be going to Guantanamo. Yeah, I don't know. maybe that's the case. You know, with all these indictments that are going on in America, anyway. Um, and you know, Bush apparently, oh, not no Bush, Trump actually sent in a lot of a thousand um, people down to Guantanamo. So they're obviously planning something. Well, this is the rumor anyway, and maybe they're getting it all ready. Now it'll probably they probably will develop it like a bit like an open prison. It's not as if they're going to be living in squalor, but at the same time, you know, um, there's you know there is rumor. You know, the word on the street is that John McCain and Daddy Bush, even though he was on near his deathbed, was were executed for human trafficking and, and treason and all that. Treason and all that. But whether that's the case or not, I mean, I've no, we've no real evidence. That's the rumor. Anyway, Steve, you got more questions there? Yeah, who's going to be torn on the sovereign seal on the twenty fourth, Tom? Uh, that's a Maguire family tradition, and Billy has every right to do that, and we'll continue to do that, and we have no problem with that. Okay, that's Grant. And John was just saying, John just made a comment earlier in relation uh, to the IRB. Uh, she said, Sinn F- I don't know uh, if there's a connection here, but she says, to me, Sinn Féin have nothing to offer the people of ERA. Uh, what can Sinn Féin offer, seeing as Mary Lou seems to be... S- well, sorry, and this, oh, sorry, I added on to this. I'm just wondering, what can they offer? Because uh, the last thing I've seen on... Uh, social media, of course, I don't believe everything on social media, but there seems to be a lot of information saying that uh, Mary Lou is siding with the other parties, read the likes of the carbon tax, etc. Yeah, uh, I'm very disappointed with Sinn Féin. Uh, we have nothing to do with Sinn Féin, and they're not part of our organisation, are we part of them, and we have no alliance with them one way or the other. But what they do is their business, but they seem to be turning into um, a Nova Fina Fall. Yeah, they sure do. They, they uh, that's all I can say about them. I wouldn't be voting for them anyway. Yeah, I, I think it's all, you know, when you see the doll and they're arguing with each other and everything else, I mean, it's all kind of a stage drama, isn't it, really? At the end of the day, they might even go outside after and go, oh, that was very good, you do it next week. You know, it's a bit like the Commons, really. Uh, they yeah, they got in a bar and drink together afterwards, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and, and this is the trouble, you can't believe it. Um, and even, like, where a lot of people supported initially Sinn Féin, and they were the party of the people at one time, but now they've kind of gone down the road, and there's a lot of people, I mean, I know people who've left the Sinn Féin, local parties, they've left because of what's going on. Again, it's the whole kind of control of the system. And, you know, I know from a corporate point of view, um, being working in the corporate world, that you know, power is an aphrodisiac, and the, the 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 power and the the control and the money, all that is when you have that, when you're in, and you have built your empire, you protect it, and you don't want anybody going near it, and the survival of the party is utmost, is foremost on the agenda, and if you're somebody in the party that's um, creating ripples or causing a problem, they'll get rid of you. I mean, it's that simple. They don't mind sacrificing people for the, for the survival of the party. No, Sinn Féin has actually, in the last year or two, sacrificed quite a lot of people. I'm actually surprised some of the, those people were there. They're really stalwarts over a number of years. So, but, uh, I don't know. They, they have sold out a long time ago. Okay. So, uh, I really don't want to discuss Sinn Féin or have anything to do with them, and I don't have any respect for them. Okay, no problem. So, the state of Ireland at the moment, uh, Tom, you know, things are, the amount of people going through the eviction courts and uh, what's happening, I mean, you know, we're we're supposed to have this constitution uh, where the family is the the highest in the land, according to the constitution. But yet, you know, these people are turning up. Um, they don't have the, the valid paperwork, they don't have the wet-in signature from the, the judge, and they're tr- completely ignoring the constitution and coming in and evicting, uh, evicting families from the homes. I mean, where do we go from here? Well, what they're doing is they're creating a form of, of total lawlessness. I, wasn't, I wouldn't call it anarchy, because anarchy, by comparison, is respectable. It's total lawlessness, because I have been monitoring a lot of those courts in Limerick and Clare and in Clonmel and Tipperary. And I have been absolutely astonished by the behavior of the uh, registrars and the judges because they're completely, uh, and by the way, and in the High Court in Dublin as well, they're completely ignoring um, 
the evidence that's presented to them. Uh, they're, they're referring to listen to it. In fact, um, Monaghan, the president, the, um, the, the, what is it, the, the, the high court, um, the, the man who puts in the cases, in, in fact, uh, there, there was a case in a, couple, a couple of weeks ago where... Uh, that's the master of the high court, uh, Ed, Edmund Honan. Yeah. Edmund Honan, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they should, they, that both, both sides should be listened to, and they haven't been. And there was an actual case where there's pre, a new president going, president going in where they should be listened to. They're also ignoring completely European law in respect to this. So the, the, the courts are lawless institutions. Uh, it, it's, it's maritime law gone completely berserk. It's got nothing to do with any constitution anywhere. And um, it's to do its... It's, it's, a, it's a land grab, a massive land and property grab at any cost without any recourse to anything that relates to any kind of law. And you know what? Uh, you, you mentioned that Chris was on, on the phone, right? And Chris yeah. has been on our show. And Chris kindly sent us a copy of his book um, where we're, we're brainwashed to say it was a famine, but it wasn't. It was a holocaust. And I've been reading his book and his research is fantastic. The thing is that the Irish people, I think a lot of Irish people don't realise that it wasn't just the Holocaust and this land grab going on today. This has been going on for hundreds of years. The Irish people have been affected by this time and time again and attacked by the system for hundreds of years. And yeah, people don't do the, the history, they don't look at the history and um, to realise this, that it's the same thing over and over again. Well, they're not taught their history. They're taught a saccharine, sick version of the history that doesn't point out these facts, that doesn't point out to have a connect, to have connect with, 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 um, with, 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 with Cromwell. They don't point out, point out the fact that 200,000 Irish people were sold as slaves into the West Indies by King James Stuart. Hmm. Uh, it's James VI, I think it was. And uh, th they don't realize that there was as many Irish slaves as black slaves sold into the West Indies. Mm. In fact, we have a, a country called Montserrat at the moment. It's called the Emerald Isle of the Caribbean. Uh, the, the people there are kind of black, but they, most of them have blue eyes, and they speak with Irish accents, with names like Murphy and Maguire and McCarthy and O'Brien. Wow. <laughs> and they sing, Irish, they sing Irish songs as well. They do it quite well. That, that was the strange. Wait, wait, Montserrat, did you say? Yeah, Monster Monster Rock, Rock, okay, okay. Of the Irish slaves. I didn't know about that until one day when I lived in New York, my car um, froze over, it was minus 30 or something. I had to get it in the garage to get it unfrozen to get it going. And the man in the garage was a black man, and I was staring at him, and I didn't know why. And eventually he came out and he says, excuse me, he was just, I can see you're staring at me, why are you staring at me? I was totally embarrassed. I, I said, I don't know. He said, look at my eyes. I looked at his eyes. He had blue eyes. You ever see a black man with blue eyes? No, it doesn't kind of ring a bell for me. Yeah, no. he had blue eyes. And he said, by the way, my name is Murphy. <laughs> 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 and he explained to me he was one of what they called the black Irish from Montserrat. And they were, they were descendants of slaves from the west of Ireland. Wow. That, that would be uncanny. Definitely going off to Montserrat and... And saying that, you know, so yeah, actually, there, there's some stuff on the internet about it. Yeah. So, where, what's the way forward for Ireland, Tom? We have about 15 minutes left. So let's look at the positives and the solutions for Ireland. What's the way forward? What do we need to do? We have to build a huge grassroots movement, north and south. We have to align ourselves with people like that man who came down and said he would chain himself to the gates in Roscommon, and his he, his, his fellow people in the north and we have got to bypass all this idiotic political soap operas and nonsense and innuendo and get the people fighting together not exactly fighting together but uniting together to form a whole new Ireland. We've got to create a new Ireland from an ancient Ireland and get rid of the crap that happened in between. Mm. And what's the solution with the current government? What, I mean, put it this way, I deregistered because I don't trust the voting system in Ireland. I, I just don't believe that it's going to be 
um, above it's never, it's point. never going to be legitimate. In fact, that's one of our aims is to deregister everybody. I deregister myself. Yeah, because uh, and I know people say, "Oh, but you have to vote." But if if I feel that the voting system is rigged, which I do, it's my belief that the voting system is rigged. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying it's my belief that it is. Um, then why vote? Why would I be bothered to vote if that's the case? Uh, there's no point in voting because it is the case. Let's assume it wasn't rigged. Uh, we're given the choice of two basically parties, Tweed and Dumb, as I call them, and Tweed and Dumb earlier on. Yeah. So that in itself is the form of rigging, and it's the, the ultimate form of rigging because they don't have to do any actual rigging. They give us two choices, Tweed and Dumb and Tweed and Dumber. And they do the same thing, and a bunch of civil servants are dictating to them and telling them what to do anyway, people who are never elected by anybody, and that will continue be, to be the case while they're allowed to be there. Yeah. Well, maybe the yellow vest, yellow vest movement is the way forward. Now, they have the 13 demands. Uh, I did see a guy earlier on on video saying there was 15, so I don't know what they have. They've added two more. But the demands... Uh, you know, we have to avoid the, as I said earlier, the divide and conquer. So the demand, the 13 demands which Steve read out last week on the show yeah. are all things that people can relate to. I can't see anybody turning around and go, no, I want to have property tax, or no, I do really want to pay my TV license. I mean, these are practical things that people don't want. And that's exactly what it's about. You know, again, I know I, I use it on a regular basis, but the Native American... A quote of if it's not good for everybody it's not good well then that them 13 demands um, well I don't know do you want to read them out or do you want to just mention no you just have them there no we should read them last week I'll actually put a link up in the chat no it's, it, it was 15 15 it's, it's, okay 15, 15 yeah. that's 15 demands yeah, and they were all pretty legitimate and normal demands and there wasn't too much being asked of anybody there they were basically rights that the people are entitled to yeah exactly and I think and that's exactly what we need to do unfortunately I know there's, you know, obviously you, there's an issue going on between yourself and, as Chris mentioned, um, Billy's group. And I would just like to think down the line. I group consists of four people. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we don't know what's going on there, right? We, this is new to us. But look. Yeah. I'd be happy to discuss it with you any time. But what, what we'd like to see is this divide and conquer thing, this issue that's going on is not helping the situation overall. No, absolutely not. You know, and, and, and this is what they want to see, and this is what they're hoping will happen, is that there'll be infighting going on, and groups will be falling out with each other, and they're looking, and they're sitting back, and they're smiling, and they're going, this is great, this is, you know, they're doing it themselves, we don't have to do anything. Yeah, and they'll be tapping Chris in the back tonight. Well, you know, that could work both ways. You know, they, they could yeah. be tapping, they could be, you know, patting you in the back as well. So, you know, again, it works both ways. Um, so, I, I don't really know what the solution is there, but I'm sure, you know, there has to be a compromise somewhere down the line. There has to be some kind of compromise. The problem is, as you probably know, Tom, from your background in psychology, is that yeah. there are people out there who are unable to compromise. You know, yeah, I agree with you, yeah. But how can you compromise with somebody when did they ask serious questions that phoned our branches and individual members of the IRB and taught them what to stand down? Well, look, there's only two people left in the IRB, John Robinson and Billy Maguire. Well, and everybody else was to stand down. Now, those people were legitimate members of the IRB for many years, many of them. Some of them were new and some of them were old. But no, they, weren't, they, they weren't voted in by those people and they didn't have any authority to stand them down. The president doesn't have the authority to send them down, neither does his secretary, and that's what they try to do, and that's what this is about. Well, I don't know. I, I can't argue, and Billy's, Billy's not on to argue the point either, so I think we should kind of leave it there, because... There's okay. not, right? But I do want to kind of talk about looking forward and on, on what we can do on a practical level. What is your uh, understanding and what is your... I mean, do you have support for the Yellow Vest movement? Let's put it that way. Would yeah, you, would, yeah, So the IRB are happy to support the Yellow Vest movement? Yes. Okay. And is that something that you... And any other movement that are working towards the goodwill of the people of Ireland. Okay. And have your members been actively involved in the Yellow Vest movement? In fact, I was talking to some today, and they told me, yes, they were. Okay, brilliant. Well, that, well, that's good. And so, the way forward for you guys, do you have, are you going to be setting up a website, or do you have a website, or what, what's the plan of attack? 
Uh, we, we, well, the, 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 those people in Dublin still control the two IRB websites. Uh, so we will be setting up a new website, but not in the immediate future, because we have some specific interactive plans for that. It won't be an ordinary website. It will be a very interactive website, and there's some new stuff going into it. So that can take a little bit of time, but we're not in a hurry about that. that that's coming. Okay, so we, are you going to have your, I won't say demands, because that sounds too harsh, but are you going to have your kind of, there's going to be certain principles that you want people to uh, employ if they're either a member or what you want to put across to the public to say what you stand for? I find it hard to, to describe that. We don't have any demands as such, other than the return of the legitimate first doll the legitimate 1919 constitution, all it stands for, and an opportunity for Irish people to vote in members of a new Dáil Parliament who will not be members of any of the established political parties and who will probably go before uh, nomination committees who will accept or reject them based on their legitimacy or the, their honourable honour and honesty but not members of any previous political parties. We have to have a complete new clean out of the system because a system that's broken can never be fixed. So therefore we've got to create a new system. Mm. Well, the people that created the problem shouldn't be the people to fix the problem, put it that way. Well, people who create problems never fix problems, do they? No, exactly, yeah. And, I mean, because we have enough, a number of them in the doll at the moment, creating a lot of problems. Uh, oh, my God, don't you know? Exactly. So, 2019, what, do, I mean, if you had a crystal ball, what would you, you know, say, your, what would be the plan for tech? What would you like to see uh, over 2019? Well, I'd like to see us setting up about uh, 50 branches, and that's more than one in each county, and then turning those branches into a people's movement. It's a people's movement. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a grassroots people's movement to put pressure on the system to collapse the present bloody system and to replace it. But we've got to create um, institutional systems to replace all of that. You just can't break something down and walk away. You've got to replace it with something. And if you're not careful with what you replace it with, you'll end up with more of the same. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you have to... And this is why... One of the things I said last week, and I think it, it has to be done, direct democracy... You know, the whole idea of when the Roman Empire started, it was all about, you know, initially helping the people. And by the end of it, they were killing each other with the greed and corruption and everything else. There has to be something in there that keeps control and monitors the system. And direct democracy process and recall, uh, as their forefathers in 1919, had the, the, the sense to put that into the Constitution. because they It's in the Swiss Constitution, worked very well there. And Ben Gilroy's done a lot to support that, and I would support Ben and Ben and that kind of movement. Yeah. No, uh, like we're not an insular movement that don't look out at anybody else. We're willing to embrace everybody who's heading in the same direction, and they don't even have to become members of ours. We'll embrace them as brothers and sisters, and we'll work with them. Yeah. Well, I think that what need, that need, needs to be done. You know, yeah. you have to have a united people. Oh, I won't say uni cool. united Ireland, united people. Steve, you have more questions for Tom? We do, we have a couple more questions uh, just in there. Um, Chris is just wondering, can you ask Tom, is a united Ireland what the IRB really want? Not just a united Ireland. A united Ireland based on the present system would be worthless. A united republic of Ireland, based on the 1919 Constitution, is the kind of United Irish Ireland we want, with the same rules as they came in with then, when there was direct democracy, and when the land and the air and the earth and the soil and the other things belong to the people, and where the banking system is responsible to the parliament and the people. That doesn't bear any relationship to what's there now, and that doesn't bear any relationship to the kind of United Ireland that appears to be being dangled in front of our nose at the moment. 
And the kind of United Ireland that's being offered is just more of the same old crap. We have lots of crooked politicians in the north, crooked politicians in the south, all going in and eating out of the same trough instead of two troughs. That wouldn't be a very good United Ireland. And plus the fact that we want to be a proper republic. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're a proper the, republic must have de- direct democracy or to be a republic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We don't want home rule. We want to be a proper republic. So yeah, by, yeah. by bringing back the initial constitution of 1919 and getting rid of the 1922-1937... Um, we're, yeah, we're not legitimate anyway. Yeah. Okay, uh, Steve. Yeah, I think this might be the final one. Uh, Laurie is tuning in from Scotland this evening, Tom, and uh, Laurie is wondering who has exactly taken over the IRB, who is the president, and whose decision was it? <laughs> I'm the president of the IRB, Tom Ryan. Uh, the decision was the members of the IRB elected me at the AGM in Thurles a couple of months ago. Uh, I was nominated by the Supreme Council of the IRB, but that didn't make me president, and wouldn't make me president, uh, and I was elected by the members of the IRB who turned up. And then four or five people who didn't turn up now have got their nose out of giant, and they want to turn up everything upside down. They have no interest in any kind of democracy, so long as they're running everything. This was a legitimate democratic decision which elected me. And I'm subject to the members of the IRB and answerable to both the members of the IRB and the Supreme Council. And I don't run my own show. I'm not a dictator. I don't dictate anything. And the Supreme Council will decide the direction I take in. But I've been working with them for a considerable time. And I agree with everything that they are doing. And I presume that's why they elected me. Okay. Do you, um, as the, I'm just thinking of Michael D. Higgins. But as uh-huh. you, as you're the, the president of the IRB, um, do you have an oath of office? Yes. Okay. And do it? Do all members have? You know, do the Supreme Committee? Do they have an oath of office as well? Yes, they do. Okay. Right. Okay. Because I know, like, obviously, that for any positions like president or even the Gardaí, and you know, they, they all have an oath of office. I was just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, that's, that's, I mean, it is kind of, it's a strange time at the moment. Now they're in, you know, 2019, it's the new year, there's a lot of things going on with Ireland. I did see, somebody posted up the eviction list on Facebook there earlier on, and the amount of evictions that's going on is unbelievable and needs to be stopped. I, I, I would hate to see another Ross Common or another Bal Brigan, but my, the feeling in my water is that, it's going to happen again because these people are just, it's all about greed. They're greedy beyond belief. They'll probably try new tactics. I don't know what new tactics they can come up with. They will at first. But they'll have to go back to their old system of evicting people. And if they do that, they're going to meet with, legi- with legitimate opposition that I will totally support. Okay. And I make no apologies for supporting them. As Dan Breen said, if a man comes into my house, I'll shoot him and I'll kill him. And I apologise to no man for that. Yeah, th- that was a different generation. Um, I, when I was a, a young a young lad, I used to hang around with uh, uh, my best friend, John Breen, was his name, and uh, his grandfather was actually Dan Breen. Um, and, uh, I, I well, could, Dan, Dan Breen didn't have any grandchildren. Uh, he did. His grandnephews, I know his family, his grandnephews and grandnieces. I knew Dan Breen as a child. He was our TD. Well, that's funny because Dan Breen's dad was um, obviously also called Dan Breen, and he was in the Irish Army as a drummer. Because uh, well, he wasn't the son of Dan Breen. Dan Breen's son was a doctor in I think it's either Manchester or Birmingham. Right. Okay. I'm gonna have to check that because I remember I remember John saying that um, my granddad had a book written about him, and it was Dan Breen. Maybe. Uh, it was, I would suggest it was his grand uncle. Uh, mm. Paddy Breen had children. Why? Right, okay. It was okay. Dan's brother. That's and I think there was another brother as well that had children. But Dan, Dan, Dan had one son, but I don't think his son had any children. Okay. That's, uh, I'll have to go and check that now. I'll have to do the, the family tree. Um, okay. Well, you know, it's, it's been fantastic. We've reached that time. It's been fantastic talking to you, Tom. Um, and, you know, as I say, the, the, the aim of the game is for us to unite, to get together, 
and the very are differences and to because you know the the elites the cabal the deep state whatever you want to call it love when they have the divide and conquer program going on and we have to be able to turn around and go okay we're not going to play that game but a big a big thank you for coming on much appreciated um, I'm going to pass you over to Steve Steve's going to get all your contact details thanks for coming on okay and thank you very much and thank you listeners and I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak to you all so I wish you all a very happy new year Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Um, for people who want to, I, I, I suppose because you're wearing two hats, you're, you're wearing you're wearing your kind of your your president of the IRB hat, and you also are a, a very good hypnotherapist as well. Um, can you give us both of your contact details? You know, for people if people want to contact you in relation to IRB uh, IRB stuff, and also if people need to want to contact you for uh, hypnosis. Well, I, I, I don't have any. Um, for hypnosis, they can get me in two ways. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com and People's Internet Radio.com. Okay, uh, Tom Ryan there with uh, some good information. Controversial information. It's a very controversial show this evening, but if you do want to contact Tom, he has given out his mobile number there and he's also given the link to the website as well. If you want to contact uh, uh, hook up with him on a pair, on a professional level and get some hypnosis. Yeah, um, it was kind of controversial and, you know, without uh, Billy being on the show, you know, it's not fair for, you know, um, Tom will have his take on it, as we said, and we said, obviously, without Billy coming on defending himself, there's no point going down that road. Thanks to Chris for ringing in and giving his point of view as well. That's much appreciated. Um, thanks, Chris. We don't really know what's going on um, there's obviously a, a disagreement between the two parties, if you want to call them that, two groups of people, and we just hope that they sort out the differences and um, and soldier on and do what needs to be done and to have a better, a better, better Ireland um, and uh, take out Tweedledum and Tweedledummer, as as Tom said, and have a have decent a uh, party in that's under the maybe the 1919 constitution with direct democracy and recall uh, so the people have the power. I mean, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. We have to bury our differences and we have to come together to make the change that we need to make. If we keep on in fighting, the powers that be are just going to be sitting back laughing at us. You know, the divide and conquer program, you know, it's, it's over and over again. Um, so we just hope that they come together and they sort out the differences. Um, that would be uh, really good to, to see uh, because we don't want to have infighting on that. Now, something that I mentioned uh, during the show, I'm just going to mention again because it's very, very important, especially for our international listeners and in America, basically. Um, you want to look up a bill called the HR 25. It's the 116th Congress, 2019-2020. And the bill is to promote freedom, fairness and economic opportunity by repelling the income tax and other taxes, abolishing the Internal Revenue Service and enacting a national sales tax to be administered prim primarily by the states. Now, Thomas did say this on his show. The IRS is not an American company and all the tax and revenue that's made in America, that has been made in America for years, has gone over to the Rothschilds and hasn't been funded. Uh, the money hasn't been put back in the country. So for years, the country has been surviving without any tax because the Rothschilds have been getting it. Um, and God knows where air revenue and air tax is going to as well. But basically... Whoever decides not to support the HR25 bill, well, they're going to expose themselves as being cabal. Because who doesn't want to not pay taxes? Think about it. The people in America, if, you're, if the IRS was abolished, you would have a pay increase immediately by about probably 30%, 35% maybe. Um, and that's more money in your pocket. And that means the GDP, the country, will come up because people will be spending and everybody's happy. Who wouldn't be happy? Ask yourself that. Who are the people that wouldn't be happy if you, if you uh, stop paying tax? So, obviously in Ireland, we're going to have to do the same thing. Eventually, it's going to happen. And I know it's going to, it has to happen in the States first and then it has to come over here to Ireland um, and uh, over in Europe. Um, and I think the Yellow Vest movement, what they're doing, taking on the banks, 
trying to take on the banks because the banks seem to be controlling everything. As we know, the banks were set up to take money off us. They weren't set up to help us. They were set up to take money off us. And you have usury, which is the interest they charge, which is, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all a pyramid scheme. And it just needs to come down and collapse. I mean, we know they don't have any money. They're all trading and solvent, you know. So there you go. That's the whole, uh, the bill. So I would go and start telling everybody to s support the HR 25 bill in the States. Because that would be the start of, of everything. I think that would be the start of the demise of the, the cabal and the deep state. If that bill gets in um, and the, it gets signed off, then that is going to be massive for America. Um, and uh, we hope that does. We hope that does happen. So support the bill, HR25, check it up. Go to the website congress.gov. Um, if you go on there, you'll actually see the bill is there. And you can have a read of it. There's a, a lot more to it. You can have a read of it and see what you think. There you go. So, an interesting show tonight. Controversial show tonight, Steve. Um, I think it's the first time we've had something like that. Um, but, interesting. Well, a, a rail <laughs> <laughs> almost came to blows. <coughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting. It was interesting to hear, um, you know, what Tom had to say. And also, Chris, uh, it, was, it was interesting on Chris, uh, from Chris's perspective as well. It was also interesting to see some of the comments on the chat rooms in relation to Billy. I mean, some people are saying that Billy should have been on here as well. And as you did say, Billy was invited on. But unfortunately, um, Billy did not get back to us in a timely uh, manner. So unfortunately, we couldn't have him on. But I mean, we will have Billy on any time. Well, can I just clarify that, Steve? Oh, we did actually ring Billy. And we, uh, and, and we tried to ring him and ring and ring him. But apparently... Um, Billy has to change his number on a regular basis because they keep stopping him from communicating. Um, you know, so there's obviously a reason why Big Brother doesn't want Billy communicating with people. So we did ring Billy's number, but it just didn't ring. Um, um, but we're more than happy to have Billy on the show um, to do an interview with Billy and get his side of um, you know what's going on. Um, and what his take is on it, because you know we there has to be you have to look at both sides and decide for yourself. You can't just listen to one side and make your decision. So um, and that offer is open to Billy. And I know that we've spoken. Uh, I've mentioned it mentioned it to Vin in passing, and um, that Billy is always welcome on the show if we can get him on. I know he's getting old now, um, but we hopefully you might even get a pre-record of Billy. That would be a good idea if we could do that. So um, he's more than welcome to come on the show. Um, but we have our, the anniversary, it's 100 years next Monday, Monday week, it's 100 years since the 1919 um, uh, Dáil Éireann was set up. And that was funded apparently by Billy's family, the Maguire family. And the, the, the cup, the Maguire cup is again something that comes from Billy Maguire. Um, so there's a lot of history there. Um, and our international listeners... You know, if you look at the Irish history, don't believe what you're told, because it's all bogus. You know, there's a lot more there that went on that they're not telling us. The hi history books have been rewritten. And people say that we are Republic of Ireland. We're not a Republic of Ireland. We've home rule. We only had two or three years of being a Republic. And then the switcheroonie was happened with King George V in 1922. And then we're back to under UK rule. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the history. Um, and uh, it's just a shame that that's the case, but look, that's the way it is. And then obviously the um, the uh, reinstate Article 48, which is the the direct democracy, was taken out of the Constitution, and we need to put that back in. So loads of things going on. But I will say, Chris's book, this has been happening in Ireland for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you know, people being starved out, lands being stolen, land grabs. It's been going on for hundreds of years. It's unbelievable, and we, it just repeats and repeats and repeats exactly what's happening today with all the evictions and everything else. This has been on for hundreds of years. It's, it's unbelievable, unbelievable that we're still falling for it. But then again, we don't really look at the history of Ireland, and we, we, and we should be because we learn from our mistakes, you know. Do you want to add there, Steve? We certainly do allow for a mistake. Well, some people do, and some people don't. I mean, there are some people who, who are uh, allegedly running this country and running it into the ground because they believe that uh, the mistakes that were made in the past, that you know, they'll just keep on making them because they haven't actually learned from them. You look at any of the previous governments and what they've done to this country. They've sold us out. They've you know, really sold us out. Uh, we've gotten a, a raw deal on so many levels in relation to... 
uh, you look you look at the the oil of this that this country has, the gas, you know, a, a lot of things that that this country has in in abundance have been sold off, and and you know they just they don't learn, and I think it will take something like the LFS movement or something. Uh, even stronger than that, where we can get the Irish people to fight against the system and not fight against each other, because every time there seems to be headway being gained in this movement, or if you want to call it a movement, um, the powers that be, the government, they will throw something in, uh, the old divide and conquer card, and once they throw that in, they just sit back and laugh at us because once they do, they, they kind of say, it's like they see us and we're making a bit of headway and we're all together, we're all kind of united as one, and all of a sudden they throw in the divide and conquer card, and now we're divided and conquered and we're fighting against ourselves, and we've we've lost sight of the prize, and they, they sit back and they laugh at us, and unfortunately that's the way it, that's the way it is, that's the way it has been, and that's probably the way it is going to be in the future unless we wake the hell up. Well, talking to a few people during the week, there's undercurrents of people not being happy. Obviously, we're not very happy, but there's undercurrents of, um, you know, m- different movements going on around the country, which is great to see because it's like uh, it's a case of it's enough's enough. That's it. We've had enough now. You know, you screwed us too much, and that's it. We're, we're going to do something about it. So I, um, I think we're going to see a lot of positives in 2019. Uh, fingers crossed, um, but I think we are going to see a lot of positives anyway. Um, now, very quickly, next week we have on the show, we have Michael Tellinger and Harry Rhodes. And we haven't had Michael Tellinger on for a long time. Um, and so Michael and Harry are going to be on, and they're going to be telling us all about things that are going on, probably with the Ubuntu movement and Harry with the, the weather modification and all things like that. So that's going to be an interesting show. Um and again, what we say is we had the United Restart.org roundtable yesterday. If you want to listen to the podcast, it's up on UnitedRestart.org. Go over there and check it out. And uh, oh, we have a phone call coming in, but it's the end of the show. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. It's the end of the show. But we have to we have to finish up. So um, for myself, anyway, Alan James, take it easy. Have a good week. And we'll uh, if you have any information or links, send them in to us. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Okay, from myself, Stephen George, it's been a great show. So, yeah, thanks to everyone who joined us on both of the chat rooms tonight, and thanks for all the comments and questions. Uh, much appreciated and made for good listening as well. Um, I believe Barry Prince is up next on People's Internet Radio with the uh, big puzzle. So, if you're on the PIR stream, stay tuned for Barry. Uh, we'll catch you again in seven days. I'll blow your mind.